Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing on this morning? We thank God for a beautiful Sunday morning. He has given us a day that is loaded with brand new mercies and full of benefits. Full of benefits. We thank God for his blessings on this morning. Thank God for each and every one of you who are here in the sanctuary. Those of you who are joining us by way of Zoom and Facebook. And those of you who are... I think I covered it, Pastor. I think you did. Okay. Good morning. We praise God for his goodness. And we thank God for another Sunday morning. Uh, we are grateful that the Lord has blessed us to be here. He uh, allowed us this wonderful opportunity to come and to worship and to praise him. I'm thankful that the Lord uh, kept us through last night, kept us through last week. Man. We realize that we are a blessed people and we are thankful for the blessings of the Lord. Let's go into a, a word of prayer. Um, I'm kind of dealing with a little allergy here. It looks like, so if I sneeze a couple times, y'all just excuse me. I'm going to try to make through the prayer, hopefully, without sneezing. Dear God in heaven, we thank you again for all things. We thank you for your many, many blessings. We thank you, God, for this opportunity and this privilege to be within your house again. Lord, you've been so good. You've been so kind. You watched over us while we slept in our beds last night. You didn't let the robbers or the murderers come in. You didn't let our houses catch on fire. Lord, we thank you for family members, our, our children, oh God, grandchildren. We thank you for the church family, yes, God. our loved ones, and all of these individuals who join us, Lord, uh, through these electronic means. We're grateful, God. We're here today because of you. So many things are happening. we got some strange things that are occurring now. Yes. But Lord, you have kept us. You have provided for us. Yes. And so God, we are grateful. We are thankful. And we praise your name. We give you glory. We give you honor. I pray, Lord, today that as we discuss and as we study this lesson, that it be beneficial. Yes, Lord, God. that we may gain knowledge, that we may grow, oh God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of I Jesus. pray, God, that you will bless the services that will come short. And let your presence be here magnified. Yes, God. Oh, God, people are coming and will be coming later who need a word, who need yes, deliverance, God. who need a touch, who need healing. Yes, God. God, you have everything that we need. Yes, So yes. we come to you, God, and we're looking to you, God. We're coming with expectancy. Lord, we praise you. We thank you again. Thank you, God. You're such a wonderful God. You are a great God. Yes, Lord. And we love you today because you first loved us. want to yes, thank God. you for the, the wonderful plan of salvation. Yes, Lord. Lord, what you've given us that we could have life. We thank you, God. And we again, we praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. All right, our subject for today is tradition and love. Tradition and love. And we are coming from Song of Solomon, verses four, I'm sorry, chapter four, verses eight through the end of the chapter. And we go all the way to the fifth chapter, verse one. All right? So if you don't have your book, turn to Song of Solomon. In some places it's called Song of Song. Saw that on one on the Bible app, so don't get it confused. Same thing. So let's get started on this beautiful, beautiful lesson that we have this morning. Our lesson aim is by the end of the lesson, we will discuss the beauty and wonder of love in a committed relationship. Reflect on our attitude about love and commitment and explain how to build a relationship that honors a marriage commitment. All right, our life need for today's lesson to know that Song of Solomon represents a timely message about marital relationships. All right? And Bible application to reflect on modern attitudes about love and commitment. Now, that, that's enough. That's a lot to e even reflect on because modern attitudes about love and commitment are, in most cases, erroneous. They are... Uh, tainted by our culture and our culture says to us you don't have to marry our culture says to us 
You can make it on your own. Our culture says to us that no man is faithful. There are a lot of fallacies. There are a lot of myths that our culture gives us about marriage. And so it is so important for godly people and churches. We have to discuss this in the church. We cannot shy away. We cannot afford to shy away from these types of, of um, conversations because our families are in turmoil right now and they are the very fabric of this nation so we have to deal with uh, subjects about family subjects about love so let's let's delve right into this pastor you got some background for us yes um this is a very unique lesson and i was listening to you when you said um that there are subjects that we must address in the church this chapter, believe it or not, it deals with sex. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's what it really deals with. Love, the relationship, and then uh, sexual desires and so forth. Uh, the Bible is a very comprehensive book. It covers everything, really, that, that, that you need. And I want to go back to what you said. We must address this because uh, when we were children, the church didn't talk about this. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you, you didn't even say the word sex. <laughs> Some other words that are in this particular uh, chapter, you didn't say it. It's certainly not in church, uh, but we've got to the point now where we must, as you say, address it because of where the world is. And and l let me say this too. Uh, I was reading where one commentator said that the Song of Solomon, which is a love story, mm -hmm. uh, the church many years ago uh, looked at. The, the interpretation was not so much as being about the marital relationship, but they thought that this book was written really to show the relationship between Christ and his bride. You can use it in that light, but actually, uh, uh, theologians today, and I agree with them, this is actually a love story that is actually teaching what should be between a husband and a wife. Now, Solomon wrote this book, and, and Solomon, I said this before because we've looked at passages from Ecclesiastes last Sunday, before then Proverbs. He wrote all three books. It is believed that he wrote the Ecclesiastes that we studied last Sunday uh, in his older years, toward the end of his life. Proverbs, when he had become a mature man, uh, the middle part of his life. But this book here, Song of Solomon, is believed he wrote it when he was a young man because uh, it starts off as a courtship, all right, as a courtship with a Shulamite woman. And then it goes into, uh, into the engagement period and then actually to the marriage and the honeymoon night, actually, is what chapter four and one and chapter five is going to deal with. And so uh, the question may be, uh, didn't Solomon have a lot of wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines, yes, he did. But perhaps, and I really believe this, this may have been his true love. This may have been his first wife, actually. May have been his first wife, his, his true love. Now, later on in life, uh, he, he allowed the enemy to, to deceive him. And you got to be very careful uh, because those thousand women, he married many of them for political reasons. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and, that, and that was the culture of that day that if you married the daughter of another king, that was a political tie. Because after all, maybe my father-in-law won't attack me. Right. Y'all follow what I'm saying here? And so that's what many Nation did. And he looked, I, I really believe this, that he looked at what the other folks were doing and, and started doing those type of policies. And of course, later on in life, these strange women turned his heart from God. Yes. He started worshiping those idol gods. There's a lesson this is rather that we right, cannot we cannot look at what the other people are doing. We must abide by the word of the Lord. Now I got several things I want to say. I don't want to be too long, but I, I, I lesson starts with verse eight. But you really need to go back and read verse one. Mm -hmm. Can I read some of these verses real quick? In verse one, it said, "Behold, thou art fair." He's talking to. Uh, at this point, to get ready to get married, you might want to say fiance. My love, behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove eyes within thy locks. Thy, thy hair is as the flock of goats. 
that appear from Mount Gilead, thy teeth are like the flock of sheep that are, that are even shorn, which came up from Washington, whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips like the thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy lot. Now, some people say, oh, wait a minute. Now, this man, I might could take the fact he said that the woman had dove's eyes, but he, he talked about her teeth like the flock of sheep that are, that are shorn or cut. You know, uh, we just think from the Western culture, but this is Middle East culture, and he's making a comparison of the beauty that's in nature. And one writer said, when you look at verse 2, that teeth are like the flock of the sheep, that he's really talking about the whiteness of a teeth. Sheep, when you shed the outer wool that's dirty, and you take that, out, that top cover off, that, that what's beneath it is white. It's very beautiful. And so he's talking about the whiteness of a teeth, and uh, then he talks about your lips like the thread of scarlet. Scarlet is, is red. And uh, uh, one writer said that uh, in terms of makeup, said that, that probably what she did, she probably made her lips red. Had on lipstick. <laughs> Which was very interesting. Uh, Brother James, you come up in the church, you know how hard the church was against makeup and lipstick and so forth. But actually, this probably was lipstick right here mm -hmm. and so forth. And she was just, what she's doing, or she had done, maybe with that, she was making herself even more desirable to her fiance that she's getting ready to get married. Thy neck is like the tower of David, build it for an armory. And so he's looking at her neck, where on there hang thousands, buckles, all shields of mighty men. Look what he said in verse 5. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies. And so he gives a description. He's talking about how beautiful this girl is and, and, and how he's excited about this, this woman who's going to become his bride. Just hang on. It's going to go even a little bit deeper than a few minutes. It's going to get real deep. And that's why I sent a message out yesterday. Every married couple need to be present for Sunday school. But not just married couple, others as well. There's some who intend to get married. There's some who have, who have been married, who can no doubt shed some light, give some advice. But the point is... And teenagers. And teenagers. I, I, I think that they, you know, from what they hear anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> that they need to be included in this lesson so that they will get the right perspective Absolutely. about what marriage and love is about and not what the world teaches. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I definitely agree. Um, we can learn so much from Solomon, who was the wisest man to ever live outside of Jesus. And so um, you talked about the fact that Solomon, in his early life, we can, you know, Solomon uh, was a man who loved God. But as he, after he began to marry these strange women, they turned his heart away from God. And so you talked about there, there's a lesson in there. There are so many lessons in here. Right. But there's also a lesson that tells us when you marry the wrong person, that person can turn your heart away from God. Yeah. So you have to be, be prayerful. You have to seek God and as far as who you should marry, don't just marry because the world says you need to marry. Don't just marry because, listen, marriage is honorable in all. And the scripture saying the bed is undefiled. So listen, marriage is beautiful. Marriage is honorable. It is nothing wrong with desiring to be married. Let's put that out there. There's nothing wrong with desiring to be married. And let's go ahead and let me put this out here, Pastor. I don't know now. You might not want me to put it out here. But there's nothing wrong with sex inside of marriage. And so we need to deal with it. We need to uh, put, uh, talk about it because I can remember we had a, a, a seminar back here, Pastor. And I can remember so plainly, it was an awesome seminar. We had some younger people in there. And, uh, at the, you know, as we began to discuss different things, I'll never forget one of the young men made the statement, it's so disturbing, but I, I want to say this, Pastor, because he made the statement, y'all nasty. 
And I want to say this because what we need to realize is that sex, the world has taken sex mm -hmm. and they have made it out to be something that God never intended. Amen. Sex is not nasty. Amen. Sex is beautiful. God has given it as a gift for husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And so when you take that gift and you misuse that gift, mm -hmm. you abuse that gift and in and all manner of evil, then you, you are looking at it from the worldly eyes and what the world has done with it. But we need to know that God intended this gift for husband and wife, and it is beautiful in his eyes. So let's just go and let's put that out it, there, Pastor. They'd be surprised at uh, what some of even our older people would say who understand Absolutely. this subject. Uh, the superintendent, Walt S. Dixon, we, we call his name a whole lot. He's a dear uh, person to my family, to my heart. And, and uh, he's 101. But in his 80s and 90s, he, he was sharp on this subject. Because <laughs> yeah. the question came up in one of our convocations when we had a class dealing with some of this as a subject and how to deal with it in local churches. Uh, the question came up about how should you dress when you go to bed, you know, romantically, if y'all read between the lines and so forth. You know, some people teach that even then you're supposed to uh, have your part of your body covered, lights off, you're not supposed to see. Superintendent Dixon got up and say, said, no, he said, you need to be able to see. <laughs> then he went for, you need to be able to see where you're going. That's what Superintendent Dixon said. And he's an elderly statesman who was just corrected what people would say, some people in the church who had a misunderstanding and may not have ever really studied this book. All right. All right, so let's go right into our first outline, Invitation to Love, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, and it reads, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon, look from the top of a manor, from the top of Shanir and Hermon, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. All right, so here, Solomon is, is calling out to, as we would say, his fiance, the person who he was betrothed to Mary, uh, and he calls her out of Lebanon, which is, of course, a very beautiful place. He talked the country, which is a very beautiful country, all right? It says that it's the north of it's north of Israel. Israel, all right? He talks about Shanir and Hermon, which are mountain ranges extended into the Lebanon and includes Mount Amana. Now, uh, I saw where the author talked about or the writer talked about she apparently lived a distance from him. That's what this author... Yeah, believed. that's what I said. The, mm -hmm. uh, the commentator said yeah. she apparently lived a distance from her, so he was calling her to... I mean, from him. So he was calling her to him. The mention of lions and leopards paints a picture of danger, mystique, grandeur, and power. He is saying that his beloved is inaccessible to him. In his mind, she might as well be at the top of a distant mountain. He wants her to be closer. That's what our commentator says. Yeah. But now he references her as his sister. Now, we must understand that that was a common expression of romantic affection during this time, during the ancient Near East. So she is his wife. She is because even as we remember when Mary was a spouse to Joseph, she was still considered his wife, even though they were going through the period where she was promised to him and they had not consummated the marriage. So I, I would assume that some of the same things are going on here. Yes, from, from the point of the commentator here, and I want to give you another view from another commentator in a minute. All right. But yes, you're correct in that in, in the Jewish culture, uh, the engagement period was one year. But mm -hmm. when you became engaged, you were considered as husband and wife. And if you're correct, the, the marriage is not consummated. The uh, male yet lives in his house. Most of the time he's preparing a place for his new bride. And of course the bride or the fiance, she stays with her, her parents. 
Now, this author seems to think that there's great distance between the two. He just desires to be with her. But then I was reading where David Jeremiah, he takes another take on this. He believed that they were together, I guess, kind of like we're getting ready to get married. And he wants to travel and see all these exotic animals and see the beauty of the mountains and, and see all these wonderful things. So there's some differences of what people think. Uh, as to whether there was distance between the two at the time or that there was, uh, that they, that he just desired that they do what? That they travel, you know, you know, they get ready to get married, you know, this is getting ready to be an exciting time. Mm -hmm. And so what do young couples do when they marry? They usually go away somewhere and they want to go somewhere where it is very beautiful, where it's very nice. Now I can see that for the second part my, with me from Lebanon, look from from the top of a manor from the top of these mountains but he plainly says at the beginning come with me from lebanon which seemed to indicate that she was she lived in lebanon yeah it does it does i'll just give you the other view gotcha uh there are different views and 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 i guess in this sense uh if you choose to, to go with what David Jeremiah said, it's okay. It, it's not going to take away from the simple message, message of this, yes. this text. Look at verse 9. He said, Thou hast ravished my heart. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. So he begins to look at the fact that it, uh, I see where uh, one person said, I am hopelessly in love with you. I, or somebody else, another person said, you drive me crazy. But what we see here is he said, he looks at, he said, you have captured my, my heart with the beauty of your eyes. And he talked about one eye, just one of your eyes, you know, cause so you can only imagine what both of them are doing. So he said, you have, in other words, you have taken my heart. You have ravished my heart. And with the chain of that neck, he, as Pastor talked about earlier, he said even your, her neck is beautiful. He talked about her neck being long. And you know, a lot, well, he talked about her neck being long. And so uh, he's just uh, spelling it out for her, the things that he loves about her. All right? That's, that's all I got for right there, Pastor. You got any more? No. Okay. Got it. Now, I also was looking at, um, well, I think you brought that out a little bit earlier, so I don't have to go back for that. Well, the author did talk about the fact, the biblical tradition of marriage, and it talked about uh, by Solomon's day, many men had strayed from God's one wife design. We must realize that from the beginning, God only intended for men to have one wife. He said most have had multiple wives. Few, however, could could attest to having as many as Solomon. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Concubines, considered to be 700 wives, I mean secondary wives, held lower social rank than women who bore the title wife. The foreign women in his life influenced Solomon's worship of foreign gods. However, he may have had a change in heart later in life. So let's, you know, we, we, now we think that, I remember a lady told me one day at work, she says, uh, every man cheats and um of course she was much older than i was and i wasn't about to argue with her i respected her age and i, I knew that she was spe speaking from her experience but of course not every man cheats that is from our culture our culture says boys will be boys our culture says that men are going to cheat our culture says all of that but look there are some good saved men who do not cheat on their wives. And I'm sitting by one. Let me go and put that out there. I do want to say, uh, acknowledge Sister Hope Williams Brown's uh, a comment from earlier when we talked about how the world has abused sex and had taken it out of the context that God intended. And she says, anytime a person doesn't understand the purpose of a thing, abuse is inevitable. Abuse is inevitable. All right. I want to. I do want to make this comment. Uh, no, she said. With well, said that man at this point has strayed from God's original design. He never intended for uh, a man to have multiple wives. He allowed it 
to a point in the Old Testament days because this was before the plan of salvation had been completed. Because when you look at Solomon's uh, father, who was very dear to God, and that was King David, David had at least nine wives. Mm. And he had some concubines as well, indicated from the scriptures. And the scripture said that he was a man after God's own heart. So God allowed some things to transpire because the plan of salvation had not been completed. Even in terms of uh, people getting a divorce. I believe one scripture where Jesus said where he allowed for the hardness of the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but now when you get to the New Testament, uh, what, does, what does the scripture tell you? Well, uh, Paul lets us know that every woman is to have her own husband. Yes. And every man have his own wife. So it, it's, it's clear uh, what God wanted. And of course, we have no excuse at all. I'm not going to say they really had an excuse then, but there's some exception that God allowed. But certainly it is not tolerated today. You are to have that one spouse. You, you make a vow to death do us part. And, 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 and of course, if things happen within the marriage uh, where there's got to be separation and divorce, you don't have as the world gives all these grounds, you don't have all these grounds for remarriage. That's kind of going a little, a little off the lesson, but I'm just going to bring it up a little bit here. So we, we need to listen. We need to know what we're doing when we get married. Absolutely. And, and let, let me say this too. Uh, I know that in this lesson, it, it, as we talked about how, how Solomon gives the description of the woman, how beautiful but I really believe that he loved this girl. Yes. Uh, and that he would grow to love her. They didn't do the courtship like we do today, the date and dating and all. They took marriage more serious back yes. then. Very much more than we do today. And and so people are not taking marriage seriously. What what that show on television talking about? Uh, married at first sight. That's all that, that's a mess. <laughs> the messing them folks up talking about married at first sight and so forth. I, I think they put them folk together and know them folk ain't gonna stay together. I think they do it for the drama to keep the ratings up and, and so forth. And so the world, and, and the idea there on that show is, hey, if y'all don't make it after eight, eight weeks, weeks. Mm -hmm. then you get, can get your divorce. And they take care of all the costs of the divorce and all this kind of stuff. That is not God's way. Absolutely. That is not God's way at all. So we need to have the right concept about marriage the right concept about sex. And, and, and if we do so and go by what the scripture says, then marriage can and will be a beautiful thing. You know, Pastor, and I want to read what Sister Hope Williams said because I was talking to somebody about this just yesterday. She said, we are seeing more polygamy these days. You have society stating that's the way to deal with many dysfunctional problems from the home. And, and I think that's very important because you warned us years ago you said to us, you said that when they uh, legalized um, gay, marriage. gay marriages, pastor said to us, they have opened the floodgate. Yeah. And he said, now all of these people uh, are going to come out. And so now you have, uh, they, they are practicing polygamy, that, which they were doing before. But also now they're talking about they're polyamorous. And that means even though I'm married, we have an open marriage that we can... Uh, have other people in our marriage, like Will and Jada, and they Smith, were pretending Smith. they were pretending that things were so uh, doing so going so well, and then she comes out uh, th in the last year saying she was in, in an entanglement, and the world caught on to that. Listen, let me tell y'all something. Don't let these people fool you all. We must follow God's prescription for marriage. Anything else is illegitimate. Anything else is illegitimate. Yes, same-sex marriage is illegitimate. To be polyamorous is illegitimate. Polygamy is illegitimate. We must follow God's prescription for marriage. And so, as you have said so many times, Pastor, um, it is an assault on the family. Right. Because the devil realizes if I can break down the family unit, if I can have broken families, I can have people broken in all parts of society. In all parts of society. So it is so important for us to know. It is so important for us to know what God's will is. And I think this lesson is. We, I don't ever remember dealing with this in Sunday school. 
but I definitely think that it is it is a great lesson. And so before go you go further, uh, there may be people in the sanctuary that want to say something. Oh yes, please. Comment, and then you that on Zoom, you can open your mic where we can hear you. Of course, Facebook, we can type your comments in, in the section. But we want to hear from you all. What what do some of you all think about this this lesson? Much needed. Um, I don't think Speak up so they can hear you on there too. I said much needed because, like you said, so many times we are we are human as well, you know, and that it's not exempt from us. And but if anything, it's for people who are married. And what happened? The enemy took what God has ordained as something beautiful and he twisted. And now, when because he twisted, people they'll look at, oh, you say y'all do that? I thought y'all don't do that. You know, and then we try to teach the other, the young ladies, you, if you wait and wait on your Boaz, I, I guarantee you it's going to be something beautiful. You don't have to go out there to that field. And when you do meet the young man, what do you have to look for? Because yes. you think that all men are going to be the same. And uh, you know, the pastor said this, it ain't going to last too long because y'all got more. Y'all, you know, ball in his boat, let that play. Y'all need to be warm so y'all can enjoy each other and learn together, you know, because it's beautiful among husband and wife. Yes. All right. Any, anyone else? Any? Yes, ma'am. I, I think it's great to be um, talking about uh, this subject in church because a lot of times our examples at home aren't, um, aren't what they ought to be. Yes. So it's great to, to know that it's possible to live and have a good marriage, even Absolutely. though you've never seen one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. And, and, and you made a real good point uh, because the devil's attack on marriage now, and I'm going to be talking about this um, in, in a couple of weeks down the road in some of my uh, teaching and message, but I, I have a book at home. The name of the book is uh, Marriage is for White People. <laughs> That's the name of the book. And, and it's directed more toward the black race because the percentage of in our race, I think we have the lowest percentage out of all the races in America when it comes to marriage. And, but the percentage is dropping in the white race as well. The author points this out too. But I remember a quote that he made of a child when they went to this school. They were dealing with the boys and they were just kind of talking to them about just about things in life. You know, what do you plan to do when you get older? You know, you're going to get married, have a wife, and have a family. And, he, he, and the child looked up and said, wait a bit, marriage? Marriage for white people. <laughs> so it seemed to indicate that within his community, I think that this was in a pretty large city, that he had not really seen many people who were married. And that is really sad yeah. that this young child, I think maybe 11 years old, would make a statement like that. I want y'all to think about something. Even in our church, you know, when, when, when I was a teenager, young man, even in my younger adult years, we went to weddings all the time. How many weddings have y'all gone to lately? How, how, many, how many weddings have been in this church lately? Think about it. We have had a lot of weddings lately. We really celebrate when we do have, see one, yeah, but yeah. we have not seen it. We're going to weddings less frequently now. Yeah. Even then, before the pandemic, we we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm talking about before the pandemic. And I'm not talking about now the, the, the pandemic because people are yet have some ceremony. Yeah, they are. But but it is less frequent yes. today. And that's that's uh, a sign of the time. Yes. It is a it shows you what the enemy is trying to do in terms of marriage and the family. Absolutely. Um, you are definitely right, Pastor. Um, there are less people because now we just say we, we just shack. We shack up, however they say it. Yeah. And so um, people say that you're crazy to marry somebody that you have not uh, lived with first. It's, it's just so commonplace. But we must uh, say, you know, continue to say that it is against God's will. It is not God's will for our life. And I remember one time, Pastor, um, you were preaching about, you were preaching against um, shacking and living with people quite, a, quite often. And Someone approached me and said, why, why does pastor keep preaching about that? I said, because people keep living like that. Yeah. We have to fight against yeah. sin. Yeah. 
And so you you can't, uh, hit, you know, just say one time and then just move on. He has to give what God gives him. And so with our culture being so pervasively in error of so many things, we have to consistently, especially teach our young people. Listen, let me say this, Pastor, and I'm going to go on to the next lesson. We have, uh, 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 people have been studying learning loss as to what has occurred with our children as a, result, as a result of the pandemic. Our children were not in school. They were in virtual learning. And, and we were so concerned about the loss that, of what they should have learned. And, and we have seen behavioral issues that have come out of that. But at least they were in virtual learning, most of them. Probably about 75% of them were learning virtually. That other 25%, we couldn't even pay to get online. But what about learning loss when it comes to the church? Yes. What about the learning loss we have suffered? Our children have suffered because they don't come now. They don't come online on Tuesday nights for the most part. I may have about five or six every Tuesday night. A lot of them are adults. But our children have suffered spiritual learning loss. And I'm going to tell y'all something. Just as the behavior has manifested with, with children in the classroom, the sinful behavior is going to manifest as well. Because when we have our children in front of the preacher, in front of the spiritual guys, in front of the teachers, that keeps their conscience sharpened. You know how we sharpen our pencils? Every time they hear God's word and hear what, they, what God requires, it sharpens that conscience. But if they have not been listening to the preacher, if they have not been in church, they have not been online, they have gotten nothing but what the world is teaching them through Hollywood, through uh, uh, YouTube, through the gaming industry. This is all they have been feeding their minds with. Amen. I'm concerned about spiritual learning loss yes. Yes. and the ramifications that will come as a result of it. Now, I said the children, but the same thing with the adults, Pastor. You need to Because be we cannot get, right. get the adults to come to church. Can't get them to get online. So we will see the end results. Just watch. Yeah, it's, it's, it's coming. That's an a excellent point that you're making. Because even if a person, and you use the children, but even for adults, mm -hmm. uh, even if a person doesn't have a testimony of being saved, and they may do certain things. There are some things because of the teaching and their respect for the church and respect for the word of God. There's something many people who are around the church who are listening won't do. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes a part of their life. I know many people who have come up in the church, uh, my age and younger, who don't have a testimony of being saved, not saved. But there's certain things they just won't do because they were taught them. And that's important. Absolutely. We want them to be saved. And, 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 and believe it or not now, that those individuals, and I know anybody's heart can be harder, but those individuals may have an easier chance later on of coming to the Lord because they're not wrapped up in so many things of the world where the devil will pull at them. So it, listen, folks, it is important that you come to church. Yes. And, and those that feel like there's some reason why I can't come. And we got a few people that got some health issues. And I understand that situation. And I, I thank God for Facebook and Zoom for those Man. individuals. Then there's some who may be a little fearful of coming right now. At least tune in and receive the word of the Lord through Facebook and Zoom and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to give this warning, Sister Ryder. I believe there's a day coming down the road where they, they're going to take the price up to be on Facebook and Zoom. It's coming. It, 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 it's coming. Right. And then eventually they're going to come to the point where they're going to try to cut us off. Because the, the world does not want to hear the word of love. They don't want you to impress anybody else. And see, there's certain things you can see on Facebook right now, preach or teach, and if somebody dislikes it, will report you, and they will take you or put you in Facebook jail, so to speak, when you cannot be on there for a period of time. The day is going to come where they're not going to allow us on Facebook and some of these other uh, forms that we have today. You need you, So you need to understand that now. 
And so, but while we have the chance of using this platform, we want to use it. Absolutely. Use it to, to as much as we can. And for those people who can't come, you need to tune in. We need the word of the Lord. And I agree, Amen. this spiritual learning loss is going to really be uh, damaging. It's going to have a damaging effect down the road. Well, it is now. Pastor. Already. Think about the, 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 the shootings that we've had. Yes. We have more murders now. So we see it in that. We're having more suicides now. Yeah. We're having a lot. If you think about it, we are, we are experiencing it now. Let's right, get to this right, lesson. Right here in green. Absolutely. All these murders that we're having now. You got to see where it's coming from. Go, go ahead. All right. How do I love thee? That's verses 10 through 15. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices? Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. And the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, campfire and spikenard. Spikenard and saf saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living water and streams from Lebanon. So here Solomon really goes deep here. He, he uses metaphors. Uh, that's why I say Shakespeare doesn't have anything on Solomon now. Yeah. He uses these metaphors. He compares her love to wine. Mm -hmm. He compares the way that she smells to ointments and spices. <laughs> he says that her lips, uh, her lips drop honeydew mm -hmm. uh, for, or honeycomb. And honey and milk are under her tongue. Mm -hmm. And I was reading where the author said honey and honeycomb are highly prized luxury items in the ancient East. Milk and honey are common expressions in the Old Testament used to indicate fertility, prosperity, and the and abundance of the best things in the ancient world. So she has the best of the best yeah. right there in her lips, in her eyes, in her, uh, even her <laughs> body, the way she smells. He goes on in verse 12 and 13 to talk about uh, her garden being enclosed and uh, a spring shut up, a fountain seal. Here he is hinting toward her virginity. So she is a virgin. All right. Thy plants and orchard and pomegranates. Um, pomegranates are an edible fruit slightly smaller than a grapefruit with a reddish color. Inside is thick skin, the, the writer says, are roughly 600 arrows, seeds covered with juicy pulp. So he begins to to, uh, to uh, break down what each one of these fruits are. And then he, he, when you read the description of each one of them, Solomon says that this is what he sees in his beloved, in his betrothed. All right? Um, yeah. He goes on to talk about, I noticed three of the uh, frankincense, myrrh, well, two of them. I think gold was the one that was added uh, when they took these, uh, when yes. the wise men... Uh, took the gifts to Jesus. So he even makes mention of these. So he, he it, it is just a beautiful sight as he expresses uh, the love that he has for her and what he sees in her. Yes. Go ahead. That's, that's what it. I got for that one, Pastor. You, you, you got it covered. Uh, beautiful illustration here. Uh, these fruits that uh, he's used to describe uh, his, uh, well, by now, we're really at the marriage point, really. Uh, and yes, she was a virgin. That's indicated by verse, what is that, verse 12, a garden clothes is my sister, my spouse. Spring shut up, fountain seal. So he would be the first person that she has been would, would be with in that, in that manner to consummate the marriage. Verse 15 is another reference, a fountain of gardens, a well of living water. Garden here is not like today. We think about a garden in our backyard where we trying to grow some cucumbers and some peas and so forth. More like a but park. More, yeah, beautiful more like park. a beautiful park. Mm -hmm. You know, even when Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, it, it was a place with, I think, trees and organs and so forth. So it's, it's a park. So he's describing uh, and he's excited about 
uh, this marriage and the time he's going to spend with his new bride. And I want to talk about the fact that she had saved herself for marriage. Good point. Because in yeah. this, in our culture, we, we act like that is impossible. And I will admit that considering the fact that TV bombards our young people with images and, and uh, all types of ideology about sex, uh, music bombards our young people with ideas about sex as they sing about it and they have misuse it but listen let me tell you something young people you can and should save yourself for marriage not just the females but the males as well right god intended for you to save yourself for marriage and when you do so you can enjoy the fact that I, this is the only person i have ever been with and that's a beauty in itself so yes there are still some virgins out there I want to say it again. There are still some virgins out there. You do not have to give in to sex because of what everybody else is doing. It is sad, y'all, that I, I teach babies. I teach, what, 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds in middle school. And many of our middle school children, I'm not talking about in, in, in Lake Village. I'm talking about period. Many middle school children have already started engaging in sex. What 12, 13, 14 year old knows anything about sex? 15, 16, 17 year old, 18 year, yeah, I'm going on up there. They don't know nothing about sex. But what the world has has put this picture in their mind. And so they, they try to play out what they've seen in on, on TV. They try to play out what the music industry has told them and has sold them. So listen, saints, we have got to teach our children about sex within the confines of marriage. We cannot give up that fight. We cannot give up that fight. And yes, that's why I said the teenagers need to be right here this morning so that they can hear, yes, it's not old fashioned. It's not old fashioned to save yourself from marriage, but it is beautiful to save yourself from marriage. All right, Pastor, you want to say anything else? All right, we have one more verse. Our time is out, but it's not really out because we, if we go to 10 o'clock, we're still in good time. <laughs> Love and joy, that's Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16 through 5, verse 1. And it says, Awake, O north wind, and come thou south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. I am coming to my garden, my sister, my spouse. So in verse 16, the female begins to speak. To speak. And again, she is invite, inviting her husband to enjoy her body. I, mean, I can just, I might as well see it. It's, it. She's inviting him to enjoy her body because as I said earlier, she has saved herself for her spouse. And so he responds, I am coming to thy garden, my sister, my spouse. All right. Anything else, Pastor? No, I think we covered it. I want to I want to read this here before we close out. For singles, too, in case you thought this was only for Mary. Yeah. It is important to note that Song of Solomon is applicable for singles as well. The analogy of the enclosed garden reminds singles to reserve intimacy for marriage and to seek other ways to express love when they are in a committed relationship. This means one, looking beyond physical attributes to the other person's heart, the spiritual and natural character of the person. Two, not buying into society's ticking clock mantra. And three, expressing love in, in non-physical ways. All right. We thank God for everything that has been said today. I, I, I saw where uh, Sister... Uh, Sister Patricia Barry said one thing about Solomon. He has had enough wives to know what true love is, supposed is supposed to be like. Is that right or not, Pastor? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me just say this, Sister Barry. <laughs> um, again, what we said at the beginning of the, the lesson. I personally believe that this was his first wife and that it was his true love. And I think that he really uh, learned what love was about in this particular marriage. Now, uh, those other marriages that came afterward, because we said that God allowed uh, in, in, in this time before 
the plan of salvation was complete for men to have more than one wife. Of course, he went to the extreme, went too far, in particular, marrying all these strange women. I don't believe those 1,000 women, I don't believe that he loved all of them. Absolutely I, I, he, not. He, he did not. I don't believe he slept with all of them. I don't, he probably yeah. did not. But he uh, did it for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the politics got him into trouble. And so forth. And so he went the other way. Now, I did say last week when we looked at Ecclesiastes that we do believe that he did get right with God before he died. Uh, I, I, I do believe that. But he went through so much heartache because of what he did. So in terms of understanding what love is, I would say that he got the understanding from this particular marriage here. All right. Okay, so well explained. Thank God for the message. <laughs> right. Yes, ma'am, sister Lance. God bless you. <laughs> Thank God. Well explained. Oh. All, right. All right. Yes. All right. So God bless you. Listen, you still have time to come down. Uh, it's 1030. We are in in-person service. We're going to have a great time today. We look forward to seeing you at 1030. God bless you.